Hey, welcome back to Geology Guy. In today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about the crust of the Earth, as well as something called the lithosphere. And we're going to start talking about plate tectonics. Now, in the last video, we talked about the different layers of the Earth, the inner and the outer core, the mantle and the crust, and how they differ based on their chemical makeup, which makes them more or less dense, which is why the mantle sits above the core and why the crust sits above the mantle. But we can actually further divide, subdivide the crust itself, based on chemical makeup and therefore density as well, into two types of crust. There's the continental crust and the oceanic crust. Now, oceanic crust makes up the crust that sits under the ocean basins, and the continental crust is the crust that makes up the continents. The reason why the ocean basins are basins is because the oceanic crust is much more dense and much thinner than continental crust. In fact, oceanic crust is relatively thin. It's only about mm, 7 to 10 kilometers thick, which is about 4 to 6 miles thick. Compare that with continental crust, which is anywhere from well, about 25 to 70 kilometers thick, about 15 and a half miles to about 43 and a half miles thick. Now, if you were quick with your math, you just caught on to something. I just said that the thickest crust is 43 and a half miles thick. But Mount Everest, which is the highest mountain, sits at about 29,000 feet, which is only about five and a half miles. So the thickest crust is nearly 45 miles thick, but the tallest mountain, which is part of continental crust, only sits about five and a half miles above sea level. So how can that be? Well, the crust actually sits down into the mantle. It's floating on the mantle, but it sticks down into the mantle, just like an iceberg, though floating on water, sticks down into the water. And so while part of the crust sits above, a bunch of it also sits below the mantle. Let me show you an example. My kids have these little magnetic squares that all stick together and they float. So we're gonna do a little experiment. Here are the plastic pieces. You can see that they stick together like with magnets inside. I'm going to stack them all on top of each other to represent a piece of continental crust and stick it in the water to represent the mantle. Notice that only the top block sticks up out of the water. If I take the top block off, again, only the top block sticks above the water. I take another one off. And again, now only this top one sticks above the water. Now what this means is that the rest of them don't stick as far down under the water. Now, each time I'm taking a piece off, this kind of represents material being eroded off of the mountains. And the thinner the block, the thinner the crust, the less it sticks down into the water or the mantle. Now this represents an episode of mountain building as the crust gets thicker and thicker. And the thicker it gets, the more it extends down into the water or in this model, this analogy, sticking down into the mantle. So below the biggest mountains is an equally big or bigger root of the mountains sticking down into the mantle. Now, it should go without saying that the rock of the crust is hard and brittle. After all, rocks are hard and brittle. That's what we're used to, right? But not all rock is this way. In fact, the mantle, which is made of rock, can ooze and flow. Now, it doesn't flow like water. It's not runny like water, but it does flow. It's more like mm, toothpaste. The rock of the mantle that's way down deep, close to the, the core, heats up and it rises up, flows upward very, very slowly. But as it rises upward, then it starts pushing on the rock that's above it. And the rock that's above, closer to the surface, cools off. And as it cools off, it begins to sink into the mantle. And so this creates these convection cells, these large loops in the mantle, where the mantle material is heating up, rising to the surface or close to the surface, cooling off, and then dropping back down. We call these convection cells. It's similar to the way the water circulates in a, in a pan that's being heated up, where the top of the water is cooler than the water below, close to the burner. Now, the diagrams I showed you about the interior of the Earth can somewhat be a little misleading. And there's this preconceived notion that I think a lot of people have, I know I had it, that the mantle, and in fact the rest of the interior of the Earth, is liquid, is magma, which is simply what we call lava when it's still underground. And it's easy to make this assumption. Most diagrams, like the one I showed you, show varying degrees of hot, warm colors, like 
yellow and orange and red. In fact, I just told you that the mantle flows and liquid flows. You've seen videos of lava, I'm sure. And in my last video, I stated that the core itself, or at least the outer core, is liquid, albeit the inner core is solid. I even mentioned that part of the interior of the Earth is liquid. And we all know that volcanoes erupt liquid molten rock out from underground onto the surface. So the interior of the Earth must be liquid, right? Well, the truth is that both the mantle and the crust are almost entirely made of solid rock, with a very few small pockets of liquid molten rock. Though the mantle ranges in temperature from about 1000 degrees Celsius, which is about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, to 3700 degrees Celsius, about 6700 degrees Fahrenheit, there's so much pressure pushing down on it from all the rock above that it keeps the rock from melting. Even though it's very, very hot, it can't melt because of all the pressure above it. But while the mantle is solid, it doesn't behave in the same way that you're used to with solid rock. Like I said, it flows and it oozes. So how can the mantle be a solid then? Well, let's use an example. I have some Silly Putty here. I'm sure you've played with Silly Putty before, right? Silly Putty a liquid or a solid? That's right, it's a solid. But it can flow and, st and stretch and ooze. See, I'm stretching it like this. And if I take something that has a hole in it, You can see, as I push on it, it flows and oozes through that hole. Well, that's how the mantle is too. However, the uppermost part of the mantle is actually cool enough to be somewhat rigid like the crust. It doesn't flow and ooze. Instead, it can break just like the crust. So the layer of the uppermost part of the mantle, the rigid part of the mantle, all the way up through the crust forms a layer that we call the lithosphere. All of the crust and the uppermost, the rigid part, of the mantle. Below that, where the mantle can flow and ooze, is what we call the asthenosphere. Now, the lithosphere essentially is floating on top of the asthenosphere, and as it's floating around, different parts of the lithosphere are moving in different directions and at different speeds, and this causes the lithosphere to be broken up into large sections we call plates, tectonic plates. Now, the Earth has seven major tectonic plates that somewhat coincide with the continents. The North American plate includes the North American continent as well as half of the Arctic and North Atlantic Oceans, and also the easternmost part of Asia. The South American plate includes the South American continent as well as half the South Atlantic Ocean. The African plate includes most of Afri the African continent and parts of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, However, the African plate is in the very slow act of breaking apart, creating the Somali plate to the east. The Antarctic plate includes Antarctica and parts of the ocean surrounding it. The Australian plate includes Australia and a large portion of the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. The Eurasian plate includes Europe and most of Asia. And then there's the Pacific Plate, which has no continents, but covers almost the entire Pacific Ocean. And there's a few minor plates as well. On the Western Hemisphere, we have the Cocos, Nazca, and Caribbean Plates. In the Eastern Hemisphere, there's the Arabian, Indian, Sunda, and Philippine Sea Plate as well as others. And even these plates have yet smaller plates, each moving in different directions and at different velocities. For example, look at all of these smaller plates near Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. At the edges of each of these plates is where a lot of the action with geology happens. In the next video, we'll talk about some of the unique features and characteristics that we find at these boundaries. So stay tuned for the next video on plate tectonics. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.